Greetings, everyone. Happy Monday night, March 18th here uh, on a week that is uh, what I feel like is the kickoff to one of the best weeks of the year. March Madness is upon us, of course. A bummer that Michigan's not in it, but we will talk Michigan basketball here tonight. Two-man booth this evening, Anthony Broom and Clayton Safey here on the Wolverine.com YouTube channel, as we are every Monday night, also in your podcast feeds and on our website after the fact. Uh, like I said before, a lot to get to. Michigan basketball uh, is in the middle of, or at least starting, a coaching search now. Uh, Juwan Howard dismissed on Friday. Also, spring ball starts today, and just when we thought there was a little bit of stability and a little bit of kumbaya heading into Michigan spring football, uh, dealt a bit of a plot twist there in the form of uh, an assistant coach that was arrested for DUI, or OWI, I should say, and Greg Scruggs. We'll talk about that. We also talked to coordinators last week. Uh, Wink Martindale, Kirk Campbell, we'll uh, discuss some of those takeaways. And then, uh, time permitting, uh, as we do every week, we will take your questions to end the show. So, Clayton, welcome back. Uh, surely, uh, not not uh, we're not hurting for anything to talk about this week. Yeah, coaching search, let's get into it. Uh, you know, some candidates out there to discuss, and uh, we will see how it goes. Yes, yeah, spring football hit the field as well, so a lot, to, lot going on. Now, before we get into, as I say every week, the meat and potatoes of our show, uh, we are brought to you tonight by the Wolverine Special Commemorative Edition of our uh, of our monthly magazine. We did a special edition for Michigan football's 15-0 season and a national title. Uh, we have copies available in soft cover and hardback on the website at thewolverineondemand.com. Uh, info for that is also in the description below. And as you can see, both of us now over our shoulders, Clayton's holding one live here. Uh, and we also have the canvas prints over our shoulders there. So, Clayton, it looks like your background's taking a little shape. Obviously, my office, as I said, uh, I think about this time last week, did some redecorating uh, over yonder. So, uh, the book is great. Uh, I got a chance to finally read the whole thing over the weekend. A lot of guys contributed, obviously, the two of us. Chris Ballas, John Borton, uh, Drew Hallett, our recruiting guys, had some stuff in there as well. So, uh, be sure to head on over to the website and check that out. And uh, it is not too late to get your copy. Pre-orders have mailed out. We're seeing a lot of them in the wild now, but there are plenty of copies available over at thewolverineondemand.com. So, all right, uh, well, let's jump into it here. Uh, typically, we lead with football, uh, regardless of what's going on with hoops, but uh, we are in the position where we are now discussing a coaching change. Uh, I don't know how many schools – Changed football and basketball coaches in the same year. Obviously, wildly different circumstances and scenarios, but that's the spot we find ourselves in. Uh, Juwan Howard out after five seasons, and uh, that move was made on Friday. Juwan uh, breaking his silence on Sunday, uh, putting on a statement uh, filled with gratitude. Uh, it was it was all all love and, and all um, you know. I can't say he's happy with the way things gone, but you know, for a member of the Fab Five to come back. And have a chance to coach the school, obviously, on the way out the door. A lot of gratitude with that, given the stuff that he was uh, went through personally as well. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, we're not we don't need to have the discussion on whether it needed to happen or not. I think eight and twenty four on its own, three and seventeen in Big Ten play was. Uh, it seemed like it was trending this direction, um, and now Michigan has an open job. And Clayton, I want to start here because uh, you wrote, you know, after the move was made on Friday, you had written something about. You know, I think we'll, before we start discussing what candidates look like and discussing who might come here, who might be interested, I think a big question you have to ask yourself is how good of a job is this? Because I don't think Michigan basketball's problems just go out the door with Juwan Howard. I mean, certainly there are things in NIL and admissions that need to get sorted out. Uh, obviously, a lot of administrative things that can probably be done better to support whoever the next guy is. So I think there are you know, for as much as you want to lay the fleet at the blame of John Howard, and make no mistake about it, I mean, I think he does have to wear the brunt of that. But I think there are, there are also lessons uh, from the University of Michigan end of things on maybe things they should emphasize uh, in this next coaching search and selling a vision to prospective candidates. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because when John Beeline left, it was in May. It was for an MBA job. You maybe didn't get the wide array of candidates that, you would have liked given the timing now you know they they get rid of Jawan howard last friday you know pretty up to up to par with the other schools around the country that are making coaching changes it's right here in the middle of the coaching carousel but the program's in a different spot after five years of Jawan howard and yeah Jawan had some success early on in his career 
Uh, obviously, the last two years didn't go they want the way they wanted him to, uh, including this past season. Part of that is because he wasn't a good enough coach. You know, as we know, that's why he's no longer here. There were cracks in the culture, um, and, and they just didn't do a good job sustaining what they had uh, when they were the first three years, continuing what John Beeline had built. Uh, but part of that also is because of what Michigan's operation is from a basketball standpoint and the way college basketball has changed. And maybe Michigan has not evolved quite to the way it's needed to, to continue to win on the court. And a couple of things that keep coming up in different reports, one from Jeff Goodman, the other one uh, from an ESPN.com article are that it's, you know, there are some potential candidates out there who are saying uh, at least, you know, off the record to a couple different reporters that there are challenges that come with this Michigan job. Everybody saw, and this played out pretty publicly the last two years, they weren't able to get Terrence Shannon in due to admissions. They weren't able to get Caleb Love in due to admissions as well. Different problems with admissions in those two different cases, but nonetheless, those played out pretty publicly. That was kind of the, the narrative that was out there. And then the second thing, you know, so the academic standards and everything is one thing. And then NIL is another thing and probably played a part in uh, at least one of those other ones and Michigan whiffing on some other transfer targets as well. So part of what schools are selling now when they're trying to hire a coach is the salary, all the, you know, regular contract stuff that you have to work out anyway, but also what kind of plan they have in place. You know, I think I brought this up last week before Michigan even had a change, but we talked about it on this show where on threes, Pete Nakos reported that Louisville has three to $4 million pretty much in their, in, in the bank, in their collective right now to build a roster for next season. And that's going to be for the next coach to use that, you know, basically their, their own mini salary cap. Well, does Michigan have a plan like that? Because those are the discussions that are going to have to be had beyond the preliminary ones that you have in the beginning of a search. And if you're going to entice a top coach to come, then you better have a, a pretty darn good plan in place, let alone, you know, a plan. So that's a, you know, something that we don't know the full details to as to what Michigan has to sell, but we do know from the past couple of years, NIL, uh, at least that aspect of it, which is really pay for play has not been good enough. And I think that's going to scare off some coaches. So what does your candidate pool look like? Obviously we'll talk about in a second, but you know, it's, it's mostly made up of at least early on here of a lot of mid-major guys. And, and you can, you can certainly hire a good coach from those ranks. I mean, that's a pretty common jump right now in college basketball, not just right now, but historically in college basketball. Uh, but at the same time, it is somewhat of a risk. And you don't want to be back in this situation three years from now because you hired somebody who didn't get it done in their first opportunity as a high major coach. Yeah, it's important, too. And we discussed this. You and I did a chain mail piece over the weekend. I think that was also on Friday. Um basically saying that you have to, you know, when you start assembling the list of candidates, it can't be the guy that is going to win the social media reviews or win the press conference is a term that gets thrown around a lot. Like you have to, uh, you know, in terms of the timeline of this search and what it could look like, you know, I think obviously it's wildly different than football. I think that was, it was clear who the top candidate would be. You had that national title that you're looking to sustain some momentum from and kind of keep things together as you build what that next phase looks like now. I mean, I hate to see it and you already see it, you know, in the transfer portal, we'll talk about some of those guys as well, but uh, there's not anything to sustain here. I think you can, you can afford to take your time and make sure you, you run a true national search like Michigan says they are, make sure you get the right guy, make sure you talk to the right people. And I know there is a search firm involved. A couple of people had asked about that. So it's not solely on ward manual. Uh, Turn sounds like a little Turnkey. That's right. They've been, uh, they've, they've had a hand in Michigan searches before, haven't they? Was that yeah. a Harbaugh thing before? So I think there's a Michigan tie there somewhere, but yeah, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna exhaust all their options. Again, uh, Chris Ballas, uh, earlier today, it sounds like right now, maybe the top quote unquote, two guys you're looking at dusty may, I don't need, uh, Nico Medved is a guy at Colorado state that I know has modeled his game or modeled his coaching style a lot around what uh, what John Beeline did at Michigan. So I think those are two names that, that make sense to me. I think that obviously, you know, from a administrative perspective, I think you're right. Like you have to have, um, 
you know, you have to have a plan to sell, an NIL plan to sell. I know admissions is a consideration. And the thing about admissions, too, is that I don't know that there's really going to be an appetite to change that at Michigan until we get a little further down the road where these student athletes are considered university employees, because it seems like we are on the speeding freight train to that. I think maybe then you see some things getting loosened up, but, you know, there are some uh, some hurdles to clear there. So, uh, you know, I mentioned Dusty May. I mentioned Nico Medved. Uh, who are some other guys to you uh, that would stand out as, as guys that would be fits here? Because there are there are a lot of them. You know, if you're going to scour the scour the country and, and even scour the NCAA tournament, as I did earlier on Monday, uh, there are some interesting names, no doubt. Yeah, there are some interesting rumors too, uh, including from Trilly Donovan about the uh, about John Calipari and hey, if if uh, he were to give if Michigan were to give him everything he wanted which includes a pretty massive salary, I would assume, you know, Hey, maybe he would be interested. Um, and obviously that's been a weird situation for a couple of years at Kentucky where the fan base is pretty fed up with him. I was at the game <laughs> between St. Peter's and Kentucky a couple of years ago. And that was kind of, you know, it wasn't even the start of it, but it, you know, that was kind of a boiling point for them. So maybe Cal would, would, you know, escape somewhere. It just doesn't feel like that's a fit. For Michigan, I think that would be, um, you know, a tough one to sell a lot of people on, although he's obviously a, an accomplished coach, uh, no matter which way he's gotten it done. And now in college basketball, you have to start thinking about this element, too. Pretty much anything goes in terms of rules. I don't know if there are any rules. So, but no, I mean, I don't, I don't think something like that is going to happen. I mean, you look at a lot of guys that and even Dusty May, he had the, the run to the final four last year at Florida Atlantic. Um, but you know, he's not overly proven in terms of being able to you know, run this successful mid-major for a long time. Now that is one of the tougher jobs in college basketball. And he's been able to have success. There was a, uh, student assistant, a student manager under Bob Knight at Indiana. He's got some really good pedigree, uh, understands the big 10 Indiana's keeping, keeping Mike Woodson. So you might be able to get him this year. Um, you know, Nico Medved is another guy that's done a pretty good job at Colorado State. Michigan obviously beat him two years ago in the first round. Um, and, you know, so, you know, he's somebody, yeah, he does run the two-guard offense like John Beeline and, and kind of modeled his offense there. He's done a, a decent job. But that's kind of a top half of the Mountain West type of program right now to me, as opposed to somebody who's just winning at this incredible clip. Uh, somebody who intrigues me and I know is is kind of generated buzz, at least through the fan base, is Darian DeVries from Drake, who is kind of running a program that wins at a really high clip. Uh, and he actually took over for Medved uh, after Medved spent one year at Drake. He takes over. They've made the tournament the last two years. They made it in 2021 uh, and they won a first round game as well. They were kind of uh, they were kind of that hot team for a little while coming into the, the tournament as a mid-major. So. He's somebody that that does intrigue me. They went 28 and 6 this year, won the conference tournament in the Missouri Valley. Seems like some, you know, good coaching going on in the Missouri Valley. I know um Josh Shirts from Indiana State's going to get the St. Louis job, but you know, those are those are guys that can kind of make the make the jump. Um but again, we're looking at somebody making a jump and that that's a little bit risky to me. Would I give the job to John Beeline? I would. I don't think Ward Manuel has I don't know if he's talked to him since uh, you know since John Beeline left in 2019, and that's disappointing to me given what John Beeline's done for this program. I would take John Beeline for a few years and get think this thing on solid footing. Um, you know, just given the other options out there at this point, not that one of them's not going to work out. Uh, would I try to lure a, a Billy Donovan? I would also do that, right? You know, he's somebody who's proven he's won national championships at Florida. The Bulls, you know, how, how much longer is he going to be there? So, yeah, rambling thoughts on, on some of the different candidates. So apologies for that. But, you know, um, Kyle Smith, uh, you know, at Washington State is another guy who's been mentioned. You know, he's made his first NCAA tournament this year, though. So that kind of scares me a little bit. I know people have compared him to Beeline in terms of demeanor and maybe the way he's recruited to different programs that are hard to recruit to. I mean, Columbia, San Francisco. And then Washington State, what he's been able to do this year, even though they're they don't, not going to have a conference next year, is pretty impressive. But Pac-12 wasn't all that good, so that's another rambling thought on on Kyle Smith from Washington State. Yeah, here's the thing about uh, John Beeline, and again, I don't, 
Now, if, if if I was told that John Beeline wanted the job and that all Ward Manuel had to do was call him, I'd probably do that. Because if, if we're steering this this coaching search towards, oh, well, they're trying to find the next John Beeline. Well, you could also just have the bird in hand knowing that the he guy exists. is. He, he exists and he still breathes oxygen, right? And he's there to be had. Um, now, again, I also see the other side of it where you're talking about wanting to make a hire that hopefully you don't have to make a coaching change for the next you know, five to 10 years. And, and I, I get there's a little more long term of a view, but who's to say that John Beeline couldn't go five more years or so. Um, but again, you know, I, I think that when you look at towards a, a couple guys, that are, it's probably not going to be Nate Oates uh, signed a contract extension to Alabama. I know he was popular at fans, the guy that used to coach at Romulus High School just down the road from me. Um, I believe his the buyout in his new contract is $18 million. Michigan's not paying that. I think TJ Oltzelberger's at uh, Iowa State is like seventeen million dollars. I don't see them paying that. Um, yeah, he would be a great one too. And yeah, Oates Oates didn't sign that thing to then leave. You know, he he wouldn't have signed it if he had interest. So I think it's very telling that really within hours of that Michigan job opening up, uh, Greg Byrne from Alabama is like, nope, nope, we're, we're this is done. We're working a on proactive, a proactive a proactive athletic director. I will say, give him credit there, and then. Also, we should have mentioned Shaka Smart too at Marquette. Mm -hmm. There are rumors and you know reports that his buyout is massive as well. They're a private school, so they don't have to disclose that. But sounds like that might one might be in uh, double digits as well. And yeah. he, you know, he was somebody that I think if he wanted to come from Texas, maybe he would have been. You know, I, I think he he would have been able to um, back in 2019. But now he's kind of in a more comfortable spot at Marquette. He left Texas on his own. It's kind of on the hot seat for a couple of years there. It doesn't seem like right now he's going to leave a basketball school that has NIL support to come to Michigan, which is disappointing. But here's the thing, Anthony. I know we talked a lot about this last year when Hunter Dickinson was going through the transfer portal process and Michigan was missing on some guys. And I remember we had these conversations where it's like, wait, look at all the schools that are in on these top transfers, including Hunter. Some of them had to do with his local ties to the D.C. area with Maryland and Georgetown, but Kansas in the mix, you know, it's like the schools in West Virginia was getting in the mix. The schools that have the best NIL support are kind of basketball only schools. So if you're Shaka, yeah. given the nature of college basketball right now, one, you know, he, he's got things going a little bit uh, in his first couple of years there. They're a two seed this season and you risk that to then come here and not get the support you want. And then what if you don't have a good year or two, then you totally, you definitely yeah. won't have support. So it's kind he's, of an interesting time right now in college basketball. He's already done the dance where, you know, he's at a football first school where exactly. all that all that people will do if you don't win basketball games at those type of schools is shit on you and chase you out, which is exactly what kind of happened. And then he is in a much better spot now. Um, I think four year, or five years ago when that Michigan job was open the first time, I think would have been a lot more realistic. But, um, you know, just running through uh, the list here again, um, you know, in the list I put out on Monday, just of guys I'm watching in the NCAA tournament, I think that that 7-10 game uh, between, and again, Michigan's coaching search is not going to hinge on who does well in the NCAA tournament. But a lot of guys, I mean, if you're if you're putting odds on it, I think most of the candidates or most of the likely guys that are going to be in the mix for this job are in the NCAA tournament. So I look at that 7-10 game uh, between Washington Washington State and Drake. You got Kyle Smith and, and, and Darian DeVries, who... DeVries, too, also a, a Greg McDermott guy. So Greg McDermott, maybe a couple weeks ago, uh, would have been high on a lot more people's lists, but just signed a contract extension at Creighton. You know, He wants to retire there, but uh, DeVries kind of comes from that Greg McDermott mold. Uh, from there, I think you start talking underrated guys, maybe guys to, to keep a little bit of a close eye on. Uh, actually, I kind of like uh, Pat Kelsey at Charleston. Uh, he's yeah. a guy that I think that's going to be a popular upset pick, I think, that Charleston over Nate Oates in Alabama. I think some people, a lot of people probably have that in their brackets, but uh, you know, Kelsey's an Ohio native. You know, he made a pair of NCAA tournaments at Winthrop. They would have made a third one if not for you know COVID-19. And he's you know, he's 58 and 11 over the last two years there. Uh, charismatic, energetic guy. Yeah, he's fun to watch his teams. I also was out for St. Patty's Day on Saturday and uh big Michigan fan, you know. Also wanted really uh, Pat Kelsey Connor uh, out there, perfect name for St. Patty's Day as well. So hearing some buzz on that in the fan base as well from my endeavors at, at the bars this weekend. Yeah, and you know what? The reason why I'm not as opposed to 
like mid major type of guys. Danny Sprinkle at Utah State is another guy that I great name again. Danny Sprinkle, yeah, Sounds it's an awesome up, name. To be honest, you know the thing with a lot of those mid major coaches is that you know if we're just operating under the assumption that Michigan doesn't have the NIL support you'd like it to have, and maybe recruiting is going to be a little more difficult. You have to go and find some maybe weird dudes to win. And that's uh, to a certain extent what John Beeline was able to do. And then a lot of what Nico Medved has done at Colorado State. Um, you know, I kind of like those mid-major guys that have had sustained success because you are kind of piecing together rosters full of, I, I don't want to disrespect guys and call them leftovers, but, um, you know, to get into the NCAA tournament with some of those smaller schools and, you know, if you're not pulling off first round update or upsets, you're a popular pick most years to do so. I, I think there's something to be said about that too. So, you know, again, I don't know how to power rank it right now. A couple people said, you know, would asked on the board, well, who is the ideal candidate who fits best? And to be frank with you, I don't know who fits best because I don't know what Michigan's plan or its vision are right now. Um, you know, I, I, you know, knowing that and maybe this is where we kind of tran, you know, transition quickly into what's going on with the roster. I mean, uh, Doug McDaniels in the transfer portal, George, uh, George Washington, in the transfer portal, uh, Connie right. Ruth, uh decommitted from uh, Michigan earlier today. So, I mean, we're looking at a scenario where whoever comes in here is going to be pretty significantly flipping the roster. You know, Darrell Brooks, a uh, fat fat, said he's going to wait to see what they do with the next head coach. Uh, I don't think we've heard from Christian Anderson yet, but, uh, you know, a lot's still up in the air. I know Terrace Reed can come back. Um, Namari Burnett can come back. Will Cheddar, Terrence Williams has a fifth year if he chooses to use it. So it's a roster in flux um, and there's going to be a lot of work to do here. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to say that I don't envy the guy who comes in because the guy who takes this job knows that he has a chance to kind of put his own stamp on it, but there's going to be a lot to sort out roster wise. And already, you know, you lose your leading scorer, and uh, which is not, I don't think that's unexpected at all. I think even no matter how things have played out with Jawan, given the fact that there was that academic suspension, um, I'm not stunned by this at all, Clayton, but uh, your thoughts on some of the roster news that we've gotten. Yeah, I mean, someone had to lead you in scoring, and it was Doug McDaniel. Um, you know, mathematically, somebody has to, even when you go 8-24. and 24. So, you know, I didn't think Doug was all that good this year, minus, you know, the 3-0 and start and a few games here and there. And I do think his season would have gone quite a bit differently had he not been suspended for road games because – he was then even out of sync in the home games that he was playing in, played a little bit better offensively at the end of the year once he came back and was there in the lineup full time. But regardless, the fact that he was in that situation in and of itself is a red flag. He didn't play good enough defense. Um, it, you're losing guys off of an eight and 24 team. Now, the Connie Ruth thing was somewhat expected too. Um, you know, just in terms of speculation that if you were to lose Juwan Howard, you would probably lose a top 30 kid like him out of IMG Academy, four star. Um, and he said he'll continue to consider Michigan, but I mean, it's just so far down the road. Like you got to figure out who the coach is going to be at this point. George Washington, the third left it open in his statement about potentially returning to Michigan as well. Doug McDaniel said, respect it, respect the decision. So he didn't really mention anything about coming back to Michigan and I wouldn't expect that to happen anyway. He'll probably go to a pretty decent school. Um, but there are a lot of flaws in his game as well so yeah it, it's not a huge deal that you're losing some of these guys one because you expected it and two because you were so bad last year and the interesting part of hiring a new coach now too ab is like we saw what mike rhodes did at penn state this year they were able to bring in ace baldwin jr from vcu uh, with him he is the defensive player of the year in the big 10 they go 16 and 17 wasn't a great season but was better than a lot of people expected given that they ranked 353rd in the country in minutes continuity, according to Ken Palm, which is last in the country. Uh, so they go about 500, much better than Michigan, double Michigan's win total. And, you know, so part of it is whoever you bring in can bring some of their guys to Michigan now, assuming they get in through admissions. But that's a little bit of an element. That's more short term. And that'd be more icing on the cake if they do have like a conference player of the year or, or somebody like that. I think someone mentioned, was it DeVries that has a son? on the team or was it one of the other coaches? I saw that earlier today that who I guess is really good. So um, yeah, you're going to lose a lot of guys. This roster is going to be flipped either way. And, you know, George Washington, he didn't seem ready to, to really play be a major or minor contributor 
for Michigan this year, even an eight-win team. So it's not like you're losing total studs here. It's nowhere near Hunter Dickinson or anything like that from last year. So, um, yeah, it's just kind of going to be an overhaul no matter what. And I think we're going to continue to see guys enter the portal. A question here from Kyle TT who says, what about Phil Martelli? Is he a staying or going candidate? I can't speak to that. Um, Phil, I Phil to me, I think it's probably time to enjoy retirement. I think most of this year you look on the bench and a lot of it may have had to do with team performance, but the poor guy just, uh, if he, if he had any more hair to lose, it would be gone completely. I mean, the guy just, I think was put in a really tough spot early on having to coach the team and that whole transition. I, I just think the last two years we'll, we'll see, but um, I would expect a new coach to come in and, and kind of build out his own staff. I, I, I think what Michigan needs is top to bottom changes uh, to be frank with you, but um you know, any other thoughts on state of the search timeline? I know some people were hoping that Michigan would maybe work quickly on this whole thing, but given that I think a lot of your candidates are getting ready to play games this weekend, that probably looking at early next week at the earliest, if you have, a, unless a guy blows your socks off. Otherwise, I know we haven't talked about, you know, the Porter Mosiers of the world at Oklahoma. They didn't make the tournament. Um, a couple other names escape me of guys that might be on the list, but you know, right now it seems like uh, still mo very much in the candidate gathering phase as opposed zeroing in on a guy and, and putting your stamp on it. Yeah, and they're only three days in. I, I could see a scenario where by the end of this week you have a kind of a read on who the top guys are, but they're not going to accept anything before they play this weekend, you know, like you mentioned. So I think early next week at the earliest, and that's probably the case for a lot of these other schools too. I mean, Louisville's trying to hire – Ohio State got theirs done, but that was just because they promoted Jake Diebler from within. So, yeah, that's you know that's kind of the timeline. The portal is going to be in, uh, be open for the next forty-five days uh, for undergraduates. Grads can obviously go in at any time. So, there's still going to be a lot of roster movement. I saw two hundred and fifty guys went in today. There were eighteen hundred that went in last year during the off season. So there, there's going to be um, you know there's going to be a lot of guys out on the market. Those guys aren't going to make decisions so quickly either because teams are in the NCAA tournament. So it's not a huge race against the clock here, in my opinion. I mean, you can't go a month and a half without having a coach, right? But, you know, a couple of weeks, if you get the right guy, is, is um, you know, nothing to worry about. Yeah, and of course, we'll see how long the background checks take as well. Uh, as we know, that's a consideration. So uh, if you head on over to the Wolverine.com right now, a lot of basketball search stuff over there. Again, Chris put up an update on Monday morning, uh, some transfer portal stuff. I see Duncan Robinson has pretty steadily turned around his NBA career. Clayton has something up on that. And also uh, the piece that I referenced earlier about uh, guys that might be interesting to watch in the NCAA tournament. So Can I had mentioned this comment to, as well. Sure. well. Let's just keep going through the fab five. Just cycle them in. Just go Jalen next and see what they can do. It's Kyle TT says, let's keep going through the fab five. I like that. Yeah. I mean, you got a one in five chance of it, of it hitting, right? So uh, I would venture to guess, no disrespect to the other guys, they probably came the closest that they could would get on hitting on one of those guys. So um, totally agree, totally agree. And we'll no see. offense to them, yeah. One of them's a coach. Yeah. One of yeah, exactly. So all right, well, let's transition now into some spring football again. Um, you know, want to talk about coordinators that we talked to, but can't move into spring ball without talking about just just more. I'll call it a self inflicted wound because. I think what happened was was selfish and dumb and and potentially, you know, talk about fumbling a bag or fumbling an opportunity. Uh, Michigan defensive line coach Greg Scruggs was arrested for an OWI uh, early Saturday morning around 3 a.m. Uh, the Ann Arbor police confirmed that. There's not much more available out there than that right now. I know a couple outlets uh, sent in a FOIA for the police report. So we'll see what ultimately comes of that. Uh, Michigan was... Uh, uh, very quickly suspended him indefinitely. Uh, so spring ball starting on Monday, uh, so, you know, Greg Scruggs is not with them at the moment as the details of, of what was going on uh, are sifted through. But uh, this is at the very least his second incident. Uh, there are conflicting reports about a third incident that may have occurred when he was a member of the Seattle Seahawks as a player, uh, just not, you know, Last week, you know, finally you get that you lock in that last piece and Tony Alford and we go to we go to uh you know Al Glick Field House on, on Friday and we talk to the coordinators, we're like, 
all right, dang it, here we go. Like, finally, some stability. And then early Saturday morning, uh, the news of one of your new hires being arrested after you know, the background checks took several weeks and all of that. It's just uh, just for the life of them, Sharon Moore and, and the program. And it's not anyone's fault in the program, uh, just for whatever reason. That stability is continues to elude them, and now spring camp has begun. Yeah, I mean, I just look at it as, as completely isolated, and it's unfortunate and disappointing from from Scruggs' standpoint, especially like you said. I mean, multiple incidents like this, I guess you could call them incidents, but obviously, I mean, that one is, uh, you know, potentially jeopardizing lives, so it's nothing to take lightly at all. And, again, really disappointing, and I think it was reported, what, it was at 3 in the morning in Ann Arbor. I mean, like, you moved here a couple of weeks ago. What are you, what are you doing? Um, so that's, that's really unfortunate. I, I trust what Sharon is going to do. I thought it was good that they suspended him indefinitely. And yeah, you're right. It's like, they're about to hit the field. They had a walkthrough on Thursday last week. They're about to hit the field and already did today, Monday for spring ball. And you don't have a defensive line coach because of a stupid decision that he made. Um, and that sucks. It sucks for the defensive linemen, the whole defense, the entire team. It's a distraction as they go in here. Um, you know, it, it's something that a, a young coach and a new coach is, has to deal with. You know, and Sharon, I thought, again, dealt with it swiftly in terms of the suspension. And we'll see what he decides with his future going forward. He said he was going to gather all the facts on it. And I think that's smart. You know, I don't I, I will say I don't think you need to rush to anything here. Like this is it is somebody's livelihood, even though he made a dumb mistake. But I think you should have contingency plans ready to go as well. And I hope that he's doing some of that legwork behind the scenes. Yeah, and I'll keep it brief here because I don't think we need to do like a full-fledged segment on it. Um, you know, again, I, I I tend to walk on eggshells a bit when it comes to the topic of alcohol abuse and, and decisions made and things like that because I do think like while what, you know, when you make the decision to get behind the wheel impaired, whether it's drugs, alcohol, regardless, I think that that, that is a selfish decision and it's reckless. And you know, we don't, it doesn't sound like anyone else was involved. doesn't sound like anyone got hurt, which was, you know, a million, a million prayers and a million blessings, you know, for that. Um, but you take that risk when you step behind the wheel like that. And, and it's, um, it's disappointing, uh, especially given that, you know, it's not a one-time thing. Um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's necessarily something, you know, in a vacuum that should ruin someone's life, but when there is a pattern, uh, yeah, there there are concerns there. So um, this, this comment here uh, said, dude makes millions of dollars. You couldn't call a cab, Uber, or buddy to take the bus home. Just had to get in the car. Come on, man. And that's I think that more or less kind of sums it up. Um, to me, this is not a referendum on Sharon Moore. This is not a referendum on the background checks. I, I You know, people, there are a lot of people out there, probably more people than you know, have some sort of alcohol-related you know, driving or whatever it is, offense on their record and them and, and are able to continue living their lives and they learn a lesson from it. It's when it becomes a pattern, there's a couple incidents to where you do get concerned and, and you do question someone's character. So um, to me, I think that you can more or less kind of leave it at that. Um, from there, we'll see what they wind up doing. I think, uh, you know, if anything else, you know, this is, um, you know, one of the first, I'll say like major hurdles in terms of, character decisions maybe that Sharon Moore has to make. Um, you know, obviously I've had a lot of decisions and a lot of things you've had to have convictions on over these last several months as he builds out the staff. But I think that uh, knowing knowing him, I think that he does deserve the benefit of the doubt. And whatever happens, happens. Uh, but we'll we'll see what where it goes from there. But yeah, they are a coach down heading into spring camp at a position where you have, you know, again, all the talk has been stability for guys like Mason Graham and Kenneth Grant. Um, you know, defensive line room. I don't know who's, you know, we'll get some clarification on what that process looks like uh, right now without Greg Scruggs on the field, but very disappointing to hear. Um, not a great start. And, you know, in the, we'll see what happens, maybe potentially the end of his tenure at Michigan. I think all options are on the table, but I want to move into these coordinators now, Clayton. Uh, we talked to Wink Martindale and Kirk Campbell on Friday. Um both got to be inside the Al Glick Fieldhouse. At least for me, that was my first time. Just cool to see the banners hung up in there. Uh, some of the new hardware. You saw the video board in there that said, what are you doing to beat Ohio State today? So 
all of these things that we kind of see on social media to finally get a glimpse at that was cool to see. But we talked to Kirk Campbell, talked to Wink Martindale. And since we were just talking defense, I mean, a defensive coach, I mean, we'll start with Martindale, who, to me, my early takeaway, I would love to talk to this guy every single week because that is an experienced guy that knows ball and has like a dry wit about him that I think is really going to kind of, as long as he's at Michigan, endear himself to fans. Yeah, he is. And it's he's kind of got that personality. It's kind of funny, like, I've pushed back a little bit on, like, the Don Brown comparisons between Wink and Don Brown. Uh, ever since he got hired but like the in terms of aura and like personality and their different personalities it is kind of similar like he's got his own style he's wearing the uh the cutoff sweatshirt with the uh the white shirt underneath you know he's got his his style of hat on and everything else so he's he's a character um and he's very confident in their defense the defensive system that they're going to run he said he likes the talent that's on the roster he said, if, if you didn't like the talent, you can always go get more through the transfer portal. So it sounds like he's starting to understand that. And, you know, one of the bigger things I was excited to hear uh, from him about was the way he's relating to the players, the way he's going to recruit. And he said, you know, you're recruiting on a daily basis. And he said that when you, you know, when they got Kayvon Thibodeau in to the New York Giants a couple of years ago, he was 20 years old. And it's not all that different than relating to high schoolers and college players. So he's embracing that. He said, uh, you know, last week that this was a dream job for him. Um, And it is funny when he had the opportunity to come, he said that he told his wife, I think I want to do this. And she said, are you sure? He said, yeah, I think I want to do this. And here they are back in college 20 years later. But um, yeah, I I thought it was, uh, you know, it was fun to listen to him talk defense. And, you know, he's one of those guys where when he's talking, everyone's kind of leaning in a little bit, you know, hanging on every word. We have to because he is, uh, for as gruff as he looks, he is kind of soft-spoken. So you do have to lean in a little bit to hear what he's saying. Um, You know, uh, something I took away from him, and I know maybe the narratives from some, I I don't know if this is a narrative or not, but I could see where NFL people went, oh, well, you know, he was on the outs with Brian Dable and it was the only job he could have taken. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily true or not, but I get the sense that similar to – you know, similar to, again, he's a Harbaugh guy. You know, he coached for Jack Harbaugh at Western Kentucky. Obviously coached for uh, John Harbaugh with the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, a guy who respects the history of the game and, and is kind of a historian of the game in that respect. Uh, so to be able to come and coach at Michigan, a place that uh, is one of the iconic brands in college football, it's the biggest stadium in the country. I think that that's something that, uh, you know, for him, as you're thinking about what your next step is, I think that was something that, um, you know, certainly rang is exciting to him. He talked about being at the 1995, and this is something we had talked about in last week's pod where he was at the 95 Michigan Ohio State game at the big house. And uh, you know, you just you just get a sense like he's very like firm in his convictions and also um you know respectful of of history and what good football is. So uh a couple other things that I took away, uh comparing Rod Moore to Eric Weddle, which I think you know, I'm a big Eric, you know, I was a big Eric Weddle guy. When he was in the NFL, I mean, as one of the terms of IQ and and smarts. Yeah, IQ and smarts. But, you know, that's high praise for a guy that, you know, has coached on defenses with elite talent. And Rod Moore, certainly, we think the world of him uh, wasn't really himself until late last year, then had some of his best games of the season down the stretch. Now is going to be looked on to be one of those. I wouldn't be surprised if he's a captain and obviously a leader on that Michigan defense. So, uh, no, nothing but good things to say about him. Uh, it still cracks me up that he calls Ernest Hausman Ernie. Uh, He's Ernie also, now. Yeah. A, a lot of good things to say about Will Johnson as well. So uh, Wink, I, I think in the here and now, super confident guy. You know, says you know I know that we're going to play good defense. Um, so really, what we what we heard from him Friday was more of a continuation of what he you know talked about with John Jansen uh, the other day. But nice to be able to get to know him. Uh, Kirk Campbell on the offensive side of the ball, obviously the biggest item on the agenda for him is the starting quarterback battle, which has five contenders. It's going to be Jack Tuttle, Alex Orgy, Jaden Denegal, Davis Warren, and Jaden Davis. Uh, Kirk Campbell says for now they're going to start uh, the way that you'd start if you were settling or settling something within a family. You know, you go oldest to youngest, and then you evaluate from there. So sounds like those older guys will get that first crack early on in camp. 
Uh, but five contenders that are going to be judged by, you know, similarly to the way that they were judged uh, when K. McNamara and J.J. McCarthy had their battle uh, in 2022. You know, being a field general, you know, leading scoring drives, extending plays with your legs, uh, being able to make all the throws in the playbook. So, you know, to me, I think um, it might have been coach speak at the, at the same time. You know, he talks about how, you know, he's confident that, you know, they might they that they could have a guy on the roster that is capable of leading this team in 2024. But uh, a lot of time to evaluate now before the, the spring portal opens on April 15th. Yeah, we'll see how Jack Tut uh, how healthy Jack Tuttle and his shoulder are this spring as well in terms of who takes the first snap because he's clearly the oldest by what how many years probably four, uh, which is insane at 24 years old. But yeah, I mean that comment was interesting about the quarterbacks. Where the, I think you said it pretty much word for word there. I don't have it in front of me, but it was you know he's confident that there's going there's somebody on the roster that could lead Michigan next season, but he didn't say that you know that's going to be you know, somebody could lead Michigan, but that doesn't mean that there's not somebody else in the transfer portal this April that could be even better. And he did mention that, you know, they look at the portal all the time, that that's something that they're going to constantly evaluate as you have to across college football. And I wouldn't expect him to say anything differently. I did think there was probably some coach speak there for good reason. Um, Kirk Campbell, extremely smart guy, and I thought did a great job and, and always has with the media. Um, but there's still kind of that lingering thing out there that I think they're probably going to go to the transfer portal in April. Depends on who's available, you know, depends on who has interest, of course. Uh, but that's priority number one is developing those quarterbacks this spring, see what you have there and, uh, and go from there. But there's a lot to replace on the offense for sure, you know, up and down basically that roster. Yeah. It's, it's all you could do, right. It is with these five guys, because obviously Michigan played longer than everyone else. A lot of those top quarterback options in the portal dried up before the national title game. And then, you know, the, the portal was sort of dry, certainly by the time J.J. McCarthy made his decision to go. So really, like, you're left with no choice to rock with what you have right now, uh, which I don't think is the worst thing. You you have some, I mean, guys like, I, I know people sort of roll their eyes when you suggest Jack Tuttle could be the guy. People, A lot more people excited about Alex Orgy. Um, Jaden Denigal is a guy that I like. I think he could maybe be like a Wilton Spate type of guy. Uh, I know Kirk Campbell likes him as well. Said he made a lot of improvements behind the scenes last year. But uh, quarterbacks, it's just going to be, you know, I think, I'll put it this way. I think if they're not producing the way that the staff would like them to see in camp, I think we're probably going to hear about that well in advance of the portal opening up because I think part of the plan there too is, you know, if, if you do have a need somewhere, it's going to ha kind of have to be out there that there's an opportunity. So the fact that, you know, you have a GM on staff and Sean McGee now that can sort of help you coordinate that plan in terms of what the roster looks like. Um, and now you get an opportunity to evaluate what you have, which I think is a good thing. Uh, obviously a lot of new to this roster. Uh, any other takeaways from what Campbell had to say? Yeah, Donovan Edwards has stepped up as a leader. Uh, he said Kalel Mullings has shed some weight, He'd gotten a little bit quicker. Uh, which is nice, and he pointed out, hey, he, he already was fast. I remember Mike Hart saying that to me when I interviewed him at the Rose Bowl. He's like, you you know, people just haven't seen how fast he is. Like, he's going to be a complete back for us, and it sounds like he's you know, doing that with his body maybe to make sure that that he can do that. Uh, but the comment that, that really popped was, you know, Miles Hinton could be a first-round pick. They're playing him at left tackle right now. To me, it's, it's still wait and see with him because he's got the frame and probably the athleticism to, to, to get to that point, but – it's his fifth year in college football. So, you know, it's time for him to show that at this point. I know I've been, you know, on the Greg Crippen bandwagon for a couple of weeks now talking about that. But to me, it just feels like that inside, that interior of the offensive line is really solid. I don't know who's going to be at right guard, who's going to be at left guard between Josh Preby, uh, which is apparently how you say it, um, according to Carson Barnhart, who played against him in high school. Uh, or Giovanni Alhadi, but you have Crippen at center. They said Preby uh, cross training a little bit. He's snapping, uh, so maybe more likely to play center than he is tackle, like Barnhart alluded to, potentially moving him outside. And then the right tackle is the most wide open spot on the offensive line. He said they don't have starters penciled in, but um, you know, just a lot of praise for Miles Hinton. And you know, I don't know what he's done the last couple months, but. Now this is his chance to really show it. Like that room is is cleared out quite a bit. A bunch of guys that 
that went to the pros or at least going to be you know drafted or picked up this spring. So it's a good opportunity for him. Didn't you know get to the tight ends or wide receivers with Kurt Campbell, but those are the you know a couple of the more interesting position groups to me, just with all they have to replace at at receiver and then kind of how you're going to piece together the rest of the tight end room because they went with multiple tight ends on 58% of their snaps last year. You lose AJ Barner, so other guys are going to have to step up along with Colston Loveland, but he didn't cover you know that type of ground that was you know on the questioning. Of course, I will blame us in the media for it. Um, but yeah, those are just kind of, uh, you know, a few of things, a few of the things that, you know, I found interesting from Kirk. We love our QB battle clicks. That's why, um, the other thing too, um, I guess sort of pertaining to quarterbacks, but I think the way that they want to handle personnel in general is the idea that they will tailor the offense to the strength of who's on the roster and even, you know, uh, um, tinker with it based on who's a quarterback. You know, they're not, you know, you're not looking for one guy to necessarily fit everything you want in your system. You're looking for the best guy and, and the best way to accentuate the things that you, that he does well or what the team does well. So that's going to be the case at quarterback would be the case at running back, tight end, wide receiver, offensive line. Uh, we'll really just ap apply to everything on this roster. So uh, i like that that flexibility stays intact. Uh, it doesn't seem like they're going to be too bullheaded about what they run on offense, but uh, let's, how about we get into questions now? Uh, I think, it's about that time. So uh, sure. I'm going to start off with this one from, well, there's two of them here. So maybe we'll kind of lump them in the same pot. Uh, Kyle TT says, is John Beeline a realistic candidate? And Devin Scott says, is John Beeline at least being consulted as part of this? Any word on that? And two it sounds points. like no on both fronts, but I think that's a mistake, at least in the consulting part of it. Yeah, I mean – there's no question it's a mistake. And I think that John Beeline, I feel very strongly that he would like to be a part of the the consulting or, or would be happy to, um, you know, he already helps out with, uh, you know, different schools on campus at the university of Michigan as an advisor of sorts. Uh, he doesn't have, you know, a job elsewhere where it would be, you know, conflicting interest there. I mean, he, he's a Michigan guy through and through. He's the you know, one of the greatest things that's ever happened to this basketball program. So I would like to have him have input if I'm a Michigan fan for sure. And yeah, I would, I would, you know, also, you know, you see John U. Bacon's tweet the other day and about how, if, uh, you know, if John Beeline was asked, you know, to, you know, to gauge his interest or whatever, if he was reached out to, he would have some interest in the job. I mean, I would at least have those conversations. So yeah, it doesn't seem like it, the, the answer is yes on either one, which is pretty disappointing to me. Yeah. I mean, to me, one of my first orders of business, putting my ego aside, again, now I'm putting myself in someone else's shoes, would be, you know, you call up John Beeline and and you just pick his brain. You know, he's been watching a lot of basketball, obviously, since since leaving Michigan, uh, since, you know, the falling out with the Cavs and then, you know, in his role as an advisor with the Pistons. Um, and you kind of pick his brain. And if any point during that conversation, John, you get the sense that John Beeline would be interested in coming back. I think you entertain that. And, and, you know, to, I don't know that, um, you know, again, I, I don't know that you just bring them back. No questions asked. I think that I don't know that you just treat them like any other candidate, but I, I think that there's some, you know, it, it's all about selling a vision. Right. And I think that if you were to call him and just pick his brain, at least maybe you get a little feedback, if not on what he might have in mind, what other guy, how other guys might fit what Michigan's working for, you know, um, you know, not to, Make no mistake about it. I'm not comparing the institutions. I'm not comparing the men. I'm not comparing anything. But at a school like Tom Izzo at Michigan State, they consult him on what color ice or you know what what flavor of ice cream they want in the coolers in the in the you know in the break room. They ask that guy about everything. The football building is named after him. And and John Beeline, you know, when he comes back to Michigan, he's never you know he's never court side. He's never front and center. He's way up, you know, in the that middle section, uh, kind of that club section. He's always far away from it, kind of detached. And that's disappointing because I think that John Beeline should be, if not, you know, having a prominent voice and prominent, you know, sort of stake in what happens with Michigan athletics. I think that he's someone to have around and having your good graces. And I just don't I just don't get the sense that that's the case right now, which is not only is it disappointing. I think it's extremely stupid uh, from editorializing there. So. 
I don't know if there's a whole lot more to say on that. Uh, any other thoughts on JB? Uh, not really. Okay. We'll move on to – let's go to this one from – Sorry, I lost my page here on the board. We'll go to this one from our guy, Jay Sherba, on the message board. Uh, and again, uh, he says, who do you hope Sharon Moore is talking to about the defensive line coach position? What does a reasonable timeline look like now that spring ball is underway in Ann Arbor and elsewhere? Well, first of all, I will say they have not made a decision. They have not made a move with the current guy they have hired. Um, and Clayton, this is where I'm going to need an assist from you. I, do we remember who else was even in consideration for that job? Yeah, I mean, there weren't a heard. ton of names. What, who, I forget his last name. What was uh, Tim Jameson? Illinois brother. Yeah, Jameson's brother, um, the, who's the defensive line coach at Illinois. Um, you know, seems Terrence to be Jameson, a name. by the way. Terrence. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would think probably a similar pool is in play there, which you would almost feel bad at to a certain extent of, you know, taking somebody at this time, but it's the way the uh, the sport goes. Um, so, yeah, I, again, I, I don't know the names right now. Like you said, they haven't made a decision, so I don't think they're that far along here. But you kind of want to be doing your legwork, as we said earlier, right now, given the, you know, you got to make sure you have a contingency plan for yourself, depending on what they decide to do once all the details come out. Yeah. Um, I, in terms of timeline, I have no idea what to make of timelines anymore because it took – several weeks to get background checks done and made those official. Again, as you've said, part of that could be just to the, because there were several of them to do, but then Tony Alford seems like that was done and he was signed, sealed and delivered within a day. And obviously things were going on before that, but uh, so it's tough to say. Um, we'll, it's going to be kind of a fact finding mission this week as spring ball gets going. So um, do I think there will be clarity on this and where it's headed before we speak to Sharon more on Thursday, I do feel that way. So people asking about timelines, uh, I do think that at the very least we'll know if there is a vacancy or not by then. So we'll see. I don't like, I get a little, I, I get a little uncomfortable discussing jobs that might not even be open, but um, this is a case where certainly I think that's something that we might have to keep an eye on here. Uh, we'll go to this one from Cameron Clark, who says, how about Buzz Williams or Anthony Grant? I'll just say this right now. I'm not a Buzz Williams guy. Um, it just rubs me the wrong way. I just don't, I don't know that I trust an adult named Buzz. Um, no offense to any Buzzes out there. I don't know that I know any Buzzes out there, but um, Anthony Grant's I'm an interesting beer one. with a Buzz. But. Well, I've had a lot of beers with a Buzz before. Um, you know, it takes, it takes a few beers to generate a Buzz, but they do appear uh, eventually. Um, Anthony Grant's an interesting one because Dayton, um, you know, he's done a hell of a job at Dayton. You know, he'd had some, um, he's at VCU, had some, had a, Alabama's, you know, time at Alabama didn't go great. Um, but what he's done at Dayton has been extremely impressive. And if that, if that tournament wasn't canceled during the COVID year, you know, there's, there's a decent chance that, that Obi Toppin and that Dayton team go on a run. And, and to build a team like that, you know, at a mid-major school like Dayton is extremely impressive. And they've kind of sustained, not sustained it to that level, but, you know, they're back in the tournament and uh, in the mix. So um, I guess maybe a dark horse guy to look at for sure. Yeah, I mean, he's somebody who's who's been at this level. Like you said, I mean, he got let go uh, at Alabama, you know, made one tournament there. They did have the great year. It would have been exciting to see because maybe he'd be Dusty May at that point, right, if he could go on that run. Uh, he maybe would have been Dusty May a, a few years ago or, you know, w would still be looking at being up for some of these jobs like that. They, they've been good, but they haven't made the tournament, you know, since then as, as they would have in, in 2020. Um, and it, but it's just so hard to say because every job's different. You know, it, it's a lot about situation. You know, it's not like, you know, Beeline made, you know, the tournament at what, four different programs? But it's not like he was making it every year at Canisius and Richmond. Like, you got to build it up. You can finally get it to a point where you get there, um, and he did get there, but it's just so hard to judge. So, yeah, it's a guy that has more experience at this level uh, in terms of being a high major, so that's interesting. And I mean, Buzz Williams, it, it does look like he has a very high buyout, you know, has a new AD 
uh, there as well. So I wonder if he would let that happen with one of his first moves or not moves, but just, you know, in, in some of his first days on the job, but uh, would be, would be interesting to see a guy who was at Marquette uh, as well, throw him on the, you know, the Marquette um, list there along with Shaka. So yeah, not, not sure about uh, those two guys really. I feel like their names haven't come up as much. Yeah. Um, something I was looking up here while you were, and again, not to be mean, but it was, uh, it was spurred by you saying that Texas A&M does have a new AD uh, in Trev Alberts, who was just at Nebraska. I do wonder, I, I don't, and I don't, his name hasn't come up at all, so I don't see it happening, but I've been trying to figure out what Fred Hoiberg's buyout looks like. Um, I know his, I think his salary is north of 3 million now. So um, just curious, just someone else to, again, for doing the wide ranging search thing, just a name that popped into my head there, but yeah, not not crazy about uh, Buzz or Anthony Grant. I think they're, I mean, I'd probably have them probably far down my list, probably not even the top 10, to be honest with you, but uh, quality coaches who have had success elsewhere. But- I don't think Hoiberg, is, after everything he's been through at Nebraska to finally get them to the tournament, they're in as a nine seed. They're playing A&M, coincidentally. Yeah. Like, to leave for a, a team that just finished last in the Big Ten, I and just – have to do it all over again. Yeah, yeah I, I just don't – think he's going to go through that again i mean it, it doesn't it doesn't mean they're going to be great at nebraska for years to come but it just seems unlikely to me yeah i know it's just a thought um no for sure yeah let's take we'll take this last one here uh from struggle streaming with bk i hope you're not having a struggle streaming us tonight uh it says because of admissions and nil at michigan why do you guys think any big name coach would come to michigan we need to pull a good coach from a small school um because I don't think you can just chalk it up as, oh, well, they haven't been good with admissions and NIL. So, well, screw it. Just just can't hire anyone now because uh, who, who would want to come here? I still think you have to cast that wide net. Um, you know, like again, administratively, I think you have to have a vision to sell. I think that, uh, that I think the champion circle guys are doing a fantastic job, not just with the football guys, but also I'm seeing a lot of the. You know the non-revenue sports. You're, you're seeing a lot, of, a lot more players sign up with them and, and receive opportunities. So things are, I, I still think on the up and up. Um, again, you know, I, I think that I still think you know when you go through, and maybe this is a futile exercise, but you go through the big Big Ten standings this year uh, and look at the schools that finished above Michigan, who is obviously everyone this year, but <laughs> is Rutgers a better job than Michigan? I don't think so. Um, Maryland, maybe, just because you have that footprint in the DMV. I don't think Penn State's a better job. Uh, Ohio State, I think at best, is a wash, but I still maybe give the slight edge to them, given they've figured NIL stuff out, but Michigan or uh, Minnesota's not a better job. I don't think Iowa's a better job despite Indiana thinking they're the Alabama of basketball, I don't know that that job, I, I don't know how much better that job would be. Northwestern might be a better job apparently because of their NIL, but uh, you go up and down and, you know, this is a Michigan program that I think is probably from a basketball perspective. I, I think a top five or six job in this conference is that, is that fair to say, am I lowballing them? Like, is it better than that? I, I think it might be, a little bit better and part of it has to do with the circumstances which can change as you mentioned right i mean th- those can change in terms of nil you know the transfer one might not be as easy of a sell for the people at the university but no i mean you, yeah like N- northwestern's not a better job than michigan it's just because they they're not eight and 24 you know yeah. if they were both eight and 24 nobody in their right mind would choose northwestern over michigan you know to go to but that's the situation situation Michigan's in. Michigan is eight and twenty four this year, and they did have guys leave. You know, you had a great player leave Michigan for Kansas last year because of you know he could probably make ten times more and probably is at Kansas than he was Michigan. So it's not like there aren't issues, but it's not like those issues aren't correctable. And this is still a good job. You know, I, I will say though. It's like John Beeline's success over 12 years at Michigan was probably more about him than it was about the Michigan job. They hadn't made the NCAA tournament since 1998 when he came in in 2007, uh, which is just amazing, you know, to put it in that context, the run that they went on there. So it's hard to judge exactly uh, what kind of job it is. And yeah, part of it is depending on the the times and the, the changing times 
in college sports and where Michigan is relative to all that. So it's a, as I wrote the other day, it's, it's a very complicated question as to how good of a job it is. Um, and to answer this question from struggle streaming with BK, I don't think we did say that, that a Michigan or that a big name coach is going to come to Michigan. I think a lot of our discussion revolved around the fact that these are a lot of mid-major guys and you're kind of going to potentially have to gamble on seeing if they will work out at a high major. Um, so that's, you know, unless you get a Billy Donovan or somebody like that, and again, it's early in the process, a name could emerge. You know, we, we mentioned John Calipari because of the rumor was out there. We both, you know, we both said we don't think that's going to happen. So no, I, I, I think we agree with the comment here that it doesn't look like that's likely to happen. You're not going to lure away, you know, uh, somebody, you know, probably Cal from Kentucky or like one of these other big jobs. You're not going to get somebody like that. And, you know, you can still have success doing it the other way, but uh, it's just more of a risk and it's going to be an unknown probably for a few years, which is just kind of yeah. the situation they're in. Yeah. And, and again, to the, this, I don't, I don't want this to be taken as like an insult or a slight either. Um, I think there's a very good chance that the lay person or the average Michigan fan, I won't even say Michigan basketball fan, but I think there's a better than not chance the guy they hire, you're not going to be happy with because one, you've either never heard of him before, or you're not super familiar with him, or you're not sure, you know, he came from a school that was smaller. So again, I don't know that again, you know, you can't worry about winning the press conference or winning the Twitter, you know, the Twitter poll, the X poll, the polls that we'll put up on the message board. Like you got to really, and this is why I'm cool with a search firm. Some, a lot of times search firms, I think is, a bit of a grift, but you know, when you, when you need to cast as wide a net as you need to cast, um, I don't really have an issue with, with getting other people involved, but John Beeline should be involved. That search firm had better call him because I think he would have something valuable to add. That's going to do it for us tonight. A uh, little bit over, but uh, a lot to discuss, obviously with hoops, with spring football, uh, be sure to like, and subscribe. If you're watching live on the YouTube channel, uh, you can also subscribe. Uh, Use that promo code UM1 to get two months of access to the Wolverine.com for $1. That's for our viewers here on YouTube only. Uh, leave us a five-star review if you're listening on audio platforms. And again, as you can see just over our shoulders here, order that commemorative edition of the Michigan National Title uh, commemorative edition. So that hardcover book is just uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Can I just so, add that uh, Corey G in the comments, we see you. We see you. We see you, Corey G. All right, uh, that is going to do it. Uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in, for Clayton Safey, for producer Megan behind the scenes. I'm Anthony Broom. We will talk to you again later this week. Oh, oh, oh.